Yeah, just, yeah. Um, this was uh, the Dan DC Memorial Lecture that I gave in Gormanston um, a couple of years after Dan, Dan died in tw- and um, I gave it once since, I think. Great, great. Well, I, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> okay, Thanks a million well, for agreeing to chat with me as well. It's it's um it's good to have uh, all different kinds of yeah, know, well, on, on things. Yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. Great. Um, well, first of all, I was just going to ask you if you could tell me just a little bit about yourself um, before we get started even, and uh, how you started with bees and beekeeping, and then we can get into the kind of... Con- well, I started basically my, I had the beekeeping gene on the two sides of the family. My mother's father was a beekeeper and my father's mother was a beekeeper. Now, my father's mother died the year before I was born, so I didn't ever know her. And in any event, I don't think she was much of a beekeeper. <laughs> uh, if what my mother told me about her was right. But I do remember my grandfather well, my mother's father, and I used to help him quite a bit with um, putting the section frames together, putting the wax into the the frames, waxing the fra- uh, waxing the frames. Now back in those days, the foundation didn't come with wires in it. Uh, you wired the frame, and then you put the sheet of wax in with. Um, a, a, a tool that was known as a spore embedder and there was just a grooved brass wheel you heated it in um, in uh, a lamp a paraffin lamp and ran along the wires and it just gripped in and uh, they were ready then to uh, go back to the bees so I always thought that when I got my own estate so to speak that I'd get bees somewhere along the line. And uh, after I went home from college, I went to college in um, to the, the mid sixties and I qualified, I, I, my graduation was uh, 1970. And I went back home, back to Thurlis uh, to work. And I never thought of getting bees. Uh, and I bought a car off a beekeeper. And he was always saying to me, you know, you should uh, join the local beekeepers. And I'd say yes. And he'd say, there's a meeting. And of course, I'd forget all about it. And then about 19, in the early 1980s, I was talking, I offered a friend of mine uh, plants, tomato, peppers, that kind of thing. And she was said she'd call in to me at half eight one evening. No, she wasn't in until, I suppose, half nine or a quarter to ten. And she apologised by way of explanation. She told me she'd been at a beekeeper's, a beginner's course in beekeeping. And she said to me, you should come to that. You'd enjoy it. So she called for me the following week. And I went to that. And one of the things we got, I think it was the third talk uh, that was given in the beginner's course. And when we were leaving that that evening, I got a couple of copies of On Baccarat. And when I got it home, I saw there was a man in West Cork, uh, John Goggin. Uh, he was making and selling beehives. And I could get a beehive with two supers for £30. And I rang him up and I ordered two of them. And uh, in the meantime, then I went up to Bill Hayes in uh, just outside Burr, uh, between Burr and between Rusgray and Burr. And I got my equipment from him. I got a veil, a smoker, uh, frames, wax, hive tools, a lot. And I had everything at this stage, but I had no bees. So I rang Bill one day and he said, come on up, I'll sell you bees. So I bought my first stock of bees from uh, Bill Hayes. Uh, That was in 1973. I think the beginner's course may well have been in late 82. I can't really remember, but uh, I got my bees anyway in, uh, I suppose it was April 1983. And I had them low length when they swarmed. And I didn't get great advice. And uh, they swarmed again a week and a bit later. So I, I didn't have any hive for that, for that swarm. But um, 
I ordered two more from John Gong and two more hives. And I ended up uh, at the end of that year with my two colonies, two quite good colonies, but I had 14 pounds of honey. And 1983 was a really good beekeeping year, uh, but it wasn't good for me. So I decided that I had to find out about swarming and I had to crack the swarming. And uh, the following year, 1984, was probably even a better year. It, there was two very good years back to back. And uh, I remember after the first year, there was members coming into our association that had three and 400 pounds of honey. And that was a phenomenal yield from my point of view. And I said to myself, well, I'm never going to have the like of that. So the following year, I got everything right. And I looked after the bees to perfection. And uh, my two hives of bees produced uh, 240 pounds of honey. Wow. So suddenly, <laughs> suddenly, these great beekeepers that I was looking up to weren't quite as good as maybe I thought they were. Uh, so that was the start of it. And then uh, I went on from there. And that was followed by, I suppose, uh, four or five very poor years. Uh, 1988 was a reasonable year. Uh, I got, I ended up with, I think, 11 hives. And the following year, uh, I had nine hives. I lost two and then I bought three. But of the three I bought, one of them had swarmed and the other was the swarm. Uh, but I got um, over half a ton of honey from my 10 hives that year. That's so a great start. It was, first, it was the first, well, I was six or seven years on the go at that yeah. stage, but um, it was my first real crop of honey. And um, uh, th that was the start of it. And I just kept on going up a bit in numbers after that. But after, when I got bees, I decided I'd go to uh, Gormanston. Yeah. And uh, to the beginning, to the summer course. And I misbooked, I, I miscalculated the date and uh, I booked, um, I booked, I took my holidays at the wrong time, but there was nothing I could do about it because it would have inconvenienced other people. So I ended up uh, not going that year, uh, which was a pity because Ted Hooper was the guest lecturer, head of uh, Guide to Bees and Honey fame. Uh, but I went the following year. And I went every year then until uh, COVID took over for, uh, I think if I was going this year, it would have been about my 42nd year wow. or something on the trot. And in all that time, I missed um, a half a day of it. But uh, when, I, when I went uh, to um, the course in 1984, it was different in that time. Uh, there was only two dealers there. Tom Kyo and a man called Val Callum, who is long, long gone out of bees. Well, both of them are gone out of bees now. But the first thing I did when I got to Gormanston was I went into the two shops and I had to look around. And I bought Jim Watson's History of Irish Beekeeping. Yeah. And uh, I may have had that. I brought it home. It's not the kind of uh, a book that you sit down and read from cover to cover, uh, because a lot of it is uh, kind of a recital of facts and things. It's much more a thing that you'd pick up and browse through a chapter and come back to it uh, later on. But one thing that I did notice, whenever I started uh, to read it, in the introduction, Jim Watson said, Sad to relate, I couldn't find a complete set of the Irish Bee Journal anywhere in Ireland. And that remark stayed in my head. And I went up to the course, I think it was in 87, 1987. And um, they, were, they were holding a small exhibition. I, I'll come back to that in, in a few minutes. But um, at the exhibition, Eddie O'Sullivan arrived up with six volumes of the Irish Bee, Bee Journal tied together with a bit of string, a hole made through the close to the spine, and they were tied with a bit of rope, exactly as Dickens had recommended people to do. 
and um, I borrowed them off them. Oh, wait, well, no, I'm, I'm jumping the gun maybe a little bit here. Uh, no, I, um, I, if I could just go back a little bit. Yeah. Um, the, wait, no, I see. Uh, I, oh, yes, I, um, when, when, the, when I decided to collect the Irish Bee Journal from uh, Jim Watson's remark, I, it was a thing I had in my head. I did a little bit of research on it. And I discovered that it had been published monthly from May 1901 to September 1933. He missed four issues out of that. So there was 386 issues. And then later on, he published uh, the Beekeeper's Gazette uh, from 1911 to 1933. It was exactly the same magazine with a different content. Now, there was a reason for him publishing uh, that uh, the the Gazette. Uh, when the Irish Bee Journal was first published, it was published in 5,000 issues a month, which is way ahead of what he was going to sell uh, here in Ireland. So he obviously was targeting uh, beekeepers over in England as well. And the IBJ, the Irish Bee Journal, was a monthly journal. The British Bee Journal was weekly. Now, it's very hard to keep a weekly magazine as lively as a monthly. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're because you're under a bit of pressure. And strangely enough, the, with the Irish magazine, because Diggis was a much better editor than Harold Hempsell, who was editing the uh, British Bee magazine. And uh, it was adopted as the official organ by several associations in England, uh, the Perth Beekeepers, the Cumberland Beekeepers, and Croydon Beekeepers, among others. And that didn't go down very well in England with Herod Hempsell and uh, T.W. Cowan, who was the head of the uh, British Beekeepers Association. So for that reason, Diggis brought out the Beekeepers Gazette. So it wouldn't have, it wouldn't be tying it to Ireland uh, at that stage and got over that a uh, little bit of a problem. In addition, at the end of each year, these used to take a number of the unbound copies, bind them together in a book in book form, and offer them for sale. And uh, as well as that, um, I had also collected quite a few copies of. I was collecting quite a few copies of Baccarat. And um, I used to get it. I used to read it every month. Was on Baccarat and, out? At, like, were they coming out at the same time then? No, no. On Baccarat, on Baccarat was first published in 1947. Yeah. Uh, the Irish Bee Journal finished when Diggis died in 1933. Right. Diggis died in August 1933. And the last issue was September 33. Uh, it was either September or October 33. It was edited by Manley. I'm sure you've heard of Manley, yeah. the Manley Frames. Frame and yeah. other. Well, uh, Manley, um, Manley edited that as a memorial uh, to Diggis. But so when there's I, actually a gap of time there, really. Oh, there was. Yeah, yeah. there was. Um, but when I started read, when I started, when I joined the local association, I started getting the Baccarat. It was the first thing when it came in in the morning, I always read it with my breakfast. And in, I think about 1985 or 86, I'm not sure, sometime around then, uh, the library list was published. No, there was only something around 100 books in the library, so it was easy to publish it. But item 83 was three copies of the Irish Bee Journal. So I wrote to Michael Moore, who was the librarian. Michael lived in a Thai, and I borrowed the three copies from him. And what I got was actually two copies. One was duplicated. But in that, um, I got a marvellous amount of uh, information about it. And this is just a photocopy of the Irish Bee Journal. It's actually number 87, as I see, uh, that I got from the library in, 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 at that time. But this is what I got. I got a full list of the experts of the association and all of the members, 139 of them. 
And I looked down through them and I made a note of a couple of them that were relatively close to me in North Tip. Uh, there was one in Templemore, there was one in in Clanmel, there was one in Kilkenny, and then I picked two others at random. And I actually picked them off the, uh, you can see it there, uh, just on the screen in front of you, the experts. Uh, yeah. Frank, Be Frank Beamish, kill me, Nace. No, I picked him because I have a very strong Nace connection. Uh, my grandfather, from whom I learned my beekeeping, was living in Nace. Um, MJ Corcoran, Newtown, Anerton, Mel, uh, Mrs. Cronin, Kilvar Garvin. I simply picked her out of the out of the air, uh, and the other one I picked was uh, Michael Marr, uh, or was Patrick Marr of um, what was his address? I can't remember his address. He was Templemore, anyway. So. Uh, for a long time, I was wondering, how could I get in touch? How could I find out where these people's descendants were living? And I couldn't think how to do it. And then one morning, I had a eureka moment. I knew exactly how to find them. They'd be ex where they were always. So I got out the phone book and I had a look at those addresses and I found corresponding addresses. I had MJ Corcoran, Thomas McGrath, Frank Beamish, and Patrick Marr, Templemore, as well as Mrs. Cronin. And when I looked up the phone book, instead of MJ Corcoran, I found W. Corcoran, Newtown, Anna Clonmel. Thomas McGrath was T. McGrath, Bamford, Kilkenny. Now, with Frank Beamish, I took a bit of a flyer that he'd have a, he'd have a grandson called Frank. So I picked a Frank Beamish down in West Cork out of the air. Uh, and it's an unusual name. So I reckoned he'd know wh who I was looking for. And Patrick Marr of I Ivy Hall at uh, Templemore was his address. Uh, and his son, Michael Marr, was there. So I wrote a letter to the whole lot of them explaining what I was doing. And I'd say within two days, I got a phone call from Mrs. Corcoran. And she explained to me that her husband, uh, Willie Corcoran, was dead. But see, she, the Corcorans have gone out of uh, Tronmel this long time. They went to Temple Moor. They left Temple Moor because MJ Corcoran was a school teacher. They went to Johnstown County, Kilkenny, which said they're living in Thurless now. They live on Barraway, if you know where it is. Now, our house in Thurlis was on Kickham Street and Barraway. And if I went to the end of my garden and looked over the wall, I was looking into Corcoran's garden. And I knew the Corcorans all along, but I never connected to them. Uh, a day or two later, uh, Michael Marr of Ivy Hall arrived over and he had quite a bit of old material. Um, it was dirty, it was dog-eared, it was everything, but it was material. And um, Tom, Tom McGrath's daughter called, uh, she was Mrs. Murphy from Littleton. Littleton is four miles from my hall door. And she arrived over with the first 18 copies of on back of the Irish Bee Journal. And I said to myself at that stage, you know, this can be done. So uh, I was happy. Now, an interesting thing about Frank Beamish, uh, the letter I sent to Frank Beamish was passed to Major Victor Beamish. Victor Beamish in West Cork sent my letter to Castle Rock in Derry to Frank Beamish's daughter, Patricia. Patricia sent a letter to me telling me that her brother would have all that stuff. And her brother lived about eight miles from Thurlis. So every time I contact somebody, it almost came back to my own hall door. That's so amazing. Uh, it was, it was, you couldn't make it up. So then um, people got to know that I was collecting stuff. And in 1987, we had an exhibition at Gormanston and uh, myself and uh, there was another uh, girl there, uh, Mary Dwyer from Stradbally, were asked to look after it. And uh, we did. It was open for about an hour a day, but it got quite um, an interesting response from people. People seemed to be enthusiastic to do something like this, to create an archive. 
Well, Eddie O'Sullivan had arrived up with six volumes of the Irish Bee Journal that had been tied together by a previous owner. He got them when he was buying old equipment off a, a beekeeper. And I put my eye on it and I borrowed it off Eddie and it never went back to him. It came into the set because with my first volume, I now had the first seven volumes. Uh, in the meantime, I gathered together a, a fairly full set of Unbakara. I had a lot of the early issues and uh, reading through it, I found an advertisement. And the advertisement simply said, wanted copies of the old Irish Bee Journal as follows. And it gives a list of missing copies. And it says, apply to the editor on Baccarat. Now that, that uh, advert went in in 1947. So I contacted Seamus Dorn. Seamus had been the editor for a long number of years, and, but he had no knowledge of who put it in. The printers in Conmel, the Greyhound Press, they had no knowledge of who put it in. So I decided I'd never be able to find out who put it in, but I did. Because a few years later, or a few, uh, in 1956, in the 1956 issue of Unbacker, it probably took me a couple of months to get to it. I found an obituary for Dr. Phillips, who was professor in Cornell University. And in the course of the obituary, they said, a few years ago, we helped Dr. Phillips fill his collection of the Irish Bee Journal. Now I knew who put in the ad. And I thought to myself, maybe they overfilled it. So I wrote to Cornell University. Now, when I was doing this, you wrote a letter, you posted it, and then you waited months for a reply to come back. That's what I was just thinking compared to now, people just go on to Google. There was no Google, yeah. there was no internet, there was no mobile phones, there was nothing like that. Patience and, required. Well, we were used to doing things that way. We didn't yeah. know things were going to be instant whip in a few years. But anyway, I wrote to... Um, I wrote to um, the librarian in uh, Cornell, and this is, uh, you can see the letter here I got back. I don't know if you can uh, read it there, but effectively she said, yes, they did have uh, some um, duplicates, that particularly they had duplicates from about 1907 to 1910, uh, which I was totally missing. And by the way, she offered me an almost complete set of the American Bee Journal. So I wrote back to her and said, yes, I'd be delighted to take them. And then uh, she uh, wrote back to me or rang, I can't remember. Uh, she said, you know, the difficulty here is uh, there's an awful weight of stuff in the American Bee Journals. You'll have to get somebody to collect it and arrange to have it transported over. So um, no, a lot of them were bound uh, volumes as well. So anyway, in the meantime, I'd written letters to everybody I could think of in Ireland who might have uh, any access to bee journals. I wrote to John Daly, who was the beekeeping expert down in Wexford, and uh, I wrote to Patsy Bennett, and I wrote to Patsy, was the beekeeper in Clonroach, and Patsy wrote back to me. He had some journals. He didn't know what he had. Uh, he thought there was some bee journals in it, and there was also the Beekeeper's Gazette. Uh, and, but he said to me, I'm giving a lecture in Thurlis in a couple of weeks' time, and I'll bring them with me when I'm coming up. And of course, when he arrived, I got a collection of 227 issues, almost all of them new to me that I didn't have before, and with very, very few uh, duplication in it. Uh, now, his copies started at 1910 and went on from there. And there was quite a few uh, full years in it. So at that stage, I had a gap 
I had volume one that I got from Tom McGrath. I had volumes two to six that I got from Eddie O'Sullivan and 1911 to 33 that I got from Clan Roach. Uh, a lot of them were missing issues here and there, but I had a gap from 1907 to 1910. And, you know, God bless Americans, they do everything wrong. And in this instance, they bound the Irish Bee Journal from January to December. So they started in January 1907 and they bound it to December 1907. And then they went on until they bound 1910. The actual year was May to April. So I got more than the year. I actually had 1906 up to, the, I didn't have anything from January 1907. So what I got from, uh, from Cornell fitted, filled that complete gap. So I now had um, a, a, a very, very good uh, collection of uh, journals. Now, I forgot to tell you that um, after I got the first lot from Tom McGrath, uh, I was talking to Dan DC one day. Dan was one of the senior members of Irish Beekeeping. He died in 2005, he was 95 when he died. Uh, and he was in great uh, form right up to the end, beekeeping uh, to the last almost. But I said, I told Dan I was going to collect a full set of the Irish Bee Journal. And he shook his head and he said, it can't be done. We tried to do it a few years ago, but there is none of them left. They're all gone. And when I was thinking about that, I was thinking of my own situation in Thurlis, where books and magazines and things like that came into the house. They got put in the bookcase and they were left there and they were never disturbed and nobody ever threw them out. And I was sure the same thing would have happened around the country too. It was only a matter of finding where they were. So anyway, here I was. I was finding them uh, fairly well at this stage. Um, now, when I got the offer of from, um, from Cornell, I had a friend in New York who was a beekeeper. He had turned up in Gormanston the previous summer and myself and himself uh, became quite friendly. We were probably about the same level of expertise at the time. He was a man called Frank Benson and he had a daughter married in County Clare and he used to come to Ireland quite a bit. So I contacted Frank I told him the story about the offer of the journals. And he said, that's no problem, Jim, I'll run up and collect them. I didn't realize he had a round trip of over 400 miles to go upstate New York to Ithaca and come back. But anyway, he rang me uh, up when he got them. And he said, Jim, we've got a problem here. There's about 500 weight of material. I said, how am I going to bring it over? And I said to him, you know, try your lingus, maybe they'd uh, bring it over for free. So he went to our lingus and he told them that Cornell University were donating a large collection of valuable books to uh, a library in Ireland. And would they bring them over free? They'd be delighted. He said, you couldn't do any of that now. And when they arrived, I, I was in Shannon Airport when I met Frank when he came in off the airport and everybody on the flight was coming out to me with armfuls of journals and Frank had just told them to look for a bearded man in the centre of the, uh, the arrivals hall and give them to him, he'd be there waiting for me. Uh, and everybody that came up, they had armloads of journals. So we got them over uh, without any cost. I think it cost me uh, a dozen jars of honey to the Aer Lingus staff in New York. Wow. That, uh, Frank and can back. I just ask where, where you know, the library that you mentioned, where physically? It was my house. It was That's your house, library. yeah. It was the <laughs> beekeeper's library. He didn't tell them that just in case they got the idea that um, it wasn't, <coughs> it wasn't really. Official. Uh, exactly, yeah, exactly. 
And you so were doing anyway, all this like off your own back in your own time without being asked as such by anyone to do it. It was just yeah. you had yeah. the bit between your teeth. Well, it was something I, I was always in, I'm, I've always been interested in, in history. And uh, this was kind of just a bit of a challenge. I, I always uh, collected. I, I've, I have the, we have the house that's almost full of books. Yeah. Maybe eight, ten, fifteen thousand. I don't know how many books. I was are just trying in. to get the but, mental uh, picture in my head there, you know. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, uh, I was always keeping an eye out. At this stage, I was. I, I used to describe myself as a waste paper collector at this stage because anybody who didn't want anything in the line of uh, beekeeping journals, I got them. Everybody. Got, gave them to me and I took everything I got because even if I only got one item in what I was getting I was that little bit further on and um, I put together uh, a huge number of I think I went to Gormanston one year in the early 90s with 250 years of Anbakara uh, complete years uh, in bundles and I offered them all free to anybody. I, I left them on a table in a room with a notice, take what you want. Yeah. And uh, I think within an hour, uh, there was almost nothing left. Uh, they went very, very fast. But anyway, just um, we were in Gormanston one year and uh, Father Gahan died. Now, Father Gahan had been, he was the PP in Strad Valley. And he continued to live on in Stradbury. He had been PP up in, yeah, in Stradbury. He was, he was in, he was from um, upper, somewhere up around Nice. And he died in 1989. And there was an auction of his uh, goods and equipment uh, scheduled for Gormanston week. And when the auctioneers heard about Gormanston, they postponed it for a week because they reckoned if all the beekeepers in Ireland were in Gormanston or the main beekeepers, um, there wouldn't be many people at the auction. So we went down to the auction and uh, inside in the house, I spotted bound volumes of the Irish Bee Journal, volume 13, 16, 17, 18, 23 and 30, in absolutely immaculate condition. And everybody knew I was coming back the following day to buy them or to bid on them anyway. And when I came back the following day, they were gone. Oh. So I colored Dan Gahan. No. Dan didn't remember me, but we actually had been in university together. So I collared Dan and I asked him, what happened to the Irish Bee Journals? Well, he said, some of the books that we had in the auction were belonged to Knockbeg Library and Father John had uh, borrowed them. So we've taken all the books out of it and we're giving them all to uh, Knockbeg. So I said to him, well, Dan, look, there's six volumes of the Irish Bee Journal there. And it would, it would be a nice gesture if you donated them to the Federation in memory of your late brother who was president. Gosh, she said, Jim, that's a very good idea. Leave it with me and I'll run it by the family. So about, um, about, yeah, no, about, yeah, about a week or so later, I got a letter from Dan telling me that he'd given them to Peter O'Reilly in Nace to hold on to for me and to give them to me the next time he saw them. So that was another huge find. Now, these were more important than anything I got so far. Because this is, I'm just showing you here on screen, a copy of uh, a page out of uh, 1913. And you can see where it's noted in uh, handwriting. That's Diggis's handwriting. These were his own copies. And I'm able to trace how, Dan, how John Gahan bought them. Diggis, when Diggis died, he directed his daughter to burn everything he had. But she obviously took six volumes of the Irish Bee Journal as a memento of her father. And she brought them with her. She was married to the Reverend Hugh Wheaton, who was a, a, a clergyman in 
uh, somewhere in a place called Carnalway, which is close to where Father Gahan lived at the time. And he died in 19, she died in 1964, and her husband died in 1970. 69 or 70 and his auction was held in I think 71 and that's where Father Gahan bought them so there's a direct connection back to that uh, six volumes and one of the interesting things that he does in it a lot of the time when he publishes a letter in the journal he'll have uh, after the uh, person's letter he'll have the initials A.H. Carlo and then written in in hand, he has here Anne Hutton with her address in Carlo. I'm only taking your name as an example there. So, you know, it's a mine of information in Diggis's own uh, handwriting. Uh, I went on from there and um, I was over at the British uh, Spring Convention in Stonery. And I went, one of the first places I always go to when I go to the Spring Convention or the Honey Show is to Northern Bee Books because they have a second-hand um, a section as well as everything else. And one year I went up and they had four full volumes of the Irish, of the Beekeeper's Gazette. Uh, they were in the late 1920s. And I asked... I asked them if they had any more. They said, yes, we have. We just brought these along to see could we sell them. They were looking for four pounds each, five pounds per year. So I gave them 20 quid for them. And uh, I told them to hold the others for me, send me the details and I'd buy them. And uh, I got uh, quite a bit of uh, material from them. I also bought some copies from Carl Schauler. Uh, Carl was a regular visitor to uh, Gormanston. He came every year and he uh, had a bee book uh, business in Hay on Wye in, uh, in Wales. I got a copy from Chris Connolly from Drogheda. Uh, and I got miscellaneous other donations. Now, on one occasion, uh, I called up to Dan DC. Now, I want you to remember what he said to me when... I told him I was going to collect them first. It can't be done. We tried to do it before. They're not there. I went up to Dan to tell him uh, all of the, um, the journals I had collected. I suppose I was at this stage, I might have been about 50 short of a full set. And I was called out to the house and I told Dan. And without batting an eye, he looked at me and he said, Jim, when you told me you were going to do that, I knew you'd be able to do it. So Dan was a great man for running with the hare and the hounds. But anyway, we were sitting in Dan's uh, uh, living room and Kathleen disappeared. Now, Kathleen and Dan were, um, they were elderly at the time. Uh, they were well up to their 90s. And the next thing was, I could hear this thump, thump, thump coming down the stairs. And Dan said, I don't mind that. That's only Kathleen, as thought was her normal behaviour. And when I came to leave, there was a big box of stuff at the doorway. And Dan said, that's for you. And that's for the archives and see what's in it. And when I got it home, I opened it up when I got it home. And the first thing I pulled out of it was uh, a meeting of Thurless and District Beekeepers Association, which was, uh, again, coming back to, uh, because I, I was living in Thurless uh, at that stage. And um, uh, it was a, a meeting. And then there was a lot of, uh, correspondence that came from uh, Harry Reid, who was the secretary to the Irish Beekeepers Association for a long number of years. And Harry kept all the letters. His daughter passed them on to Robert Tweedy. Robert Tweedy passed them on to, De to Jim Watson. Jim Watson passed them on to Dan DC, and Dan passed them on to me. And they've lived a charmed life. Uh, and you wonder, you know, in all that um, uh, 
been sent around the country, been taken around the country, whether anything got lost or not, I'm sure possibly it did. But anyway, uh, we have a marvellous collection of uh, letters to the Irish Beekeepers Association from all over the country. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a great um, facility to have. Uh, th this, this is a shot here of the journals that I have collected. And you can see that there's quite a few of them are bound. Yeah. Now, the bound ones are ones that I have a complete set of, including the index. Uh, some of the other ones that are there, in the, the ones in plastic bags on the left are surplus to requirements, and the, the other ones are probably the same. And there's photocopies there in the middle that I got where I was short. Um, the ones at the back, you can see there's a few of them in paper bags. They uh, haven't been bound because I'm missing some little bit uh, of them. But anyway, wait until we see. Uh, no, so this is what the uh, let the archives comprises: uh, roughly 700 letters from 1903 to 1920. And these letters, there's 20 of them from Diggis. There's a letter from Herod Hempsel, and I remember I was over in England a few years ago giving a talk, and I produced it, and nobody had ever seen it before, because he made up the name Herod Hempsel. Uh, he thought a double barreled name would give him a bit more street cred, I suppose. He was mixing with people with double barreled names. And um, he made up this in 1915. Uh, his letter was from 1907, when he was simply uh, William Herod. And that's there. There's a lot of letters from Turlock O'Brien. There's a complete set of Turlock O'Brien's reports from 1912 to 1917, where he visited every beekeeper in the country. And he reports on their ability as a beekeeper, how good they are, the state of their stocks, the number of stocks they have. There's posters, there's catalogues, there's diaries, there's photographs, and of course the journals, the uh, Irish Bee Journal and the Beekeepers Gazette. But there's a lot more miscellaneous stuff. There's the uh, American Bee Journal that I mentioned. There's also uh, an almost complete set of Bee, um, not Bee Crab, Bee World, which was published by the IBRA. There's a full set of Ambacara. There's, oh God, I don't know what else is there. There's lots of stuff there. There's so much stuff there that, and you see, in the early days when I had nothing, I collected everything. And then as I collected more and more of a thing, I went after something and built it up. So that's where a lot of this I think came from. And one thing that I got that proved to be very interesting was where did they get the idea for the uh, summer course? And I came across a flyer from I think 1946 the Welsh beekeepers were having their third summer course, except their summer course was only for three days. So that's where they got it. And uh, they held it um, in Cork for the first year. And, and then they went around the country until 1961, when it arrived in Gormanston. Uh, other places around the country weren't able to accommodate in huge numbers that were coming. You know, there was up to four, five, and six hundred people turning up. Some of them would only come for a day or two, but a lot of them were staying uh, for the full week, and you needed someplace with uh, plenty of accommodation. This is the oldest flyer that I have, and you can see in the middle there, it's dated 1899, and it's a CDB hive and outfit, and the price is 21 shillings for the hive. The price list uh, down below is just under two pounds. Um, so, you know, it just gives you an idea of the prices of things. And there on the back, straw skeps were available at something like, I can't, whether you can read it there or not, uh, 16 shillings a dozen. Now, the poor skep maker didn't get a lot out of that if he had to make 12 of them. Uh, for 16 shillings. But they're, they're interesting things and they're very much off their time. This is one of O'Brien's uh, reports that I've photocopied. It's one from Dundalk in 1917. 
And um, O'Brien's writing isn't always the easiest to read. Um, no, <laughs> I can but, see that. Yeah, but his letters, when you get, uh, I've translated all of his letters. And when you um, get into reading them, uh, you can actually, he writes a great letter. They're pages and pages long, uh, and there's an awful lot of them. Um, it's difficult enough to make up some of these, but when you get at it, uh, you'd be surprised how good uh, you get at it. And you can use things like the census returns and things like that uh, to check um, addresses and the like. Uh, this is just a kind of a translation of some of his reports uh, that are there. That's from Jim Watson's book uh, on Turlock O'Brien, because Jim Watson wrote a second book uh, after his history book. He wrote a history, uh, a biography of Turlock O'Brien. And when he was writing that, he contacted me and he was absolutely delighted that I had collected an almost full set of the Irish Bee Journal and he came down and he spent two days with me in Tipperary going through the uh, going through the, the looking for what he wanted uh, for his book. This is the poster that I was talking about, Thurless and District Beekeepers Association, a public demonstration in beekeeping by Mr. T.B. O'Brien at C.J. Malloy's Bakestown Mills Holy Cross. Uh, Malloy's relatives still live there. Uh, can't remember the name now, they're not, they're not Malloy's anymore but they were delighted when I went out with a copy of that for them. This was on uh, in 1911, as you can see, and the programme is there too. And when I went out to see them, they actually showed me the bee hut that C.J. Malloy kept his bees in. It was still standing. It was very rickety. There's a photograph, I don't know if it's still there, there's a photograph of it on the IBRA website of bee bowls. Uh, subsequently, it was converted into a house for goats, but uh, it was in poor repair when I was there, and I don't know uh, if it's still standing or not. Um, this is just a photograph uh, of the Bee Tent 1902 at Glass Nevin show. And it shows you just exactly what went on. Uh, there was a demonstration going on inside in the tent with uh, O'Brien inside in a mesh cage. And everybody who went in there could go in in comfort, knowing that there wasn't going to be bees flying around the place. And especially people who were interested in beginning uh, weren't going to get stung. And here you can see uh, Gillis uh, opening a hive. Um, Gillis was actually was a Scotsman who came over to Ireland and he um, bought the Freeman's Journal and he ran it for its last uh, few years. Uh, I gave a talk on the history of Irish beekeeping one time in the Phoenix Park. And there was a guy sitting up at the front and he was really hanging on every word I said. And I knew that. And he came up and he introduced himself to me subsequently as Diggis's grandson, not Diggis, uh, Gillis's grandson. And he brought out his own magazine uh, from the years 1902 to 1908. And I also have a full set of that. So, you know, we have a, a marvellous resource that, um, I, you know, it's the envy of the British beekeepers because they had something similar. And whoever had it at some stage, instead of uh, asking who'd look after it, uh, went out and burnt the whole lot in his back garden. Uh, you know, and that's horrifying uh, of what to burn. Uh, among other things, when uh, Mick Wolf gave up um, the, the, the job of Gormanston convener, I wrote to him and I got all the uh, ledgers of the people who went to Gormanston for a period of, I think, about 1978 to about, I, I don't know when uh, he gave up, but about, 19, about 2010. So, you know, there's well over 30 years of uh, Gormanston attendances there, uh, lists, addresses, everything. Probably in total, 
breach of data protection. But uh, I'm not that um, I'm not that particular about things like that. Yeah. So, no, we'll just go on and see if there's anything else here. Yeah. Well, the use of the archives. So, what use have they been put to uh, to date? Well, first of all, they're preserving an important aspect of our beekeeping history. And I've used them quite a bit around the country when I was giving a talk on lectures to various associations. And every place I went, I do, I do a section at the end simply related to letters and uh, material relating to that particular area. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was contacted by a PhD student in the USA, and um, he wanted to know what we had. And I sent him over an email and uh, he said, I'm coming over to see it. And he flew into uh, London. He spent a little while in England looking at uh, doing other research. And then he came over and he spent two days. I was at that stage, uh, my mother was living in Nace and we were sharing the, um, she was then uh, 101. So we were sharing the uh, job of uh, keeping an eye on her. She didn't need much minding, I may tell you, but it was to clip her wings more so than anything else. But uh, I, I brought all the material up to Nace and um, he, he took, a, a, he got a, a, a B and b just a couple of hundred yards up the road. He was able to walk down by the canal uh, and come to the house. And he did that for two days. And at the end of it, then he said, it's an awful pity. He said, you haven't a photocopier here. And I slipped out of the room and I rang Michael Gleeson. Michael was the secretary of the Federation at that time and he was living in Enfield, which is actually quite close to Nace. So I rang him and about a half an hour later, there was a knock at the door and Michael Gleeson came in with a photocopier to allow him to photocopy what he wanted. So it was, he used it and he gave it great praise in his thesis. Um, a few years, a good few years ago, uh, a student in Canterbury University in England was looking for a book. It was recommended to them. It was, I, I, off the top of my head, I think it was called um, Pollination, British Pollination of British Flowers or British Flowers and Pollination. I can't remember what it was. It was written by a man called A.S.C. Deans, who had been guest lecturer on a couple of occasions in Gormanston. So she Googled it. Oh, no, she went to um, she went to the British Library. They never heard tell of it. She went to Kew. They never heard tell of it. She went to a university library. They had to do that. So she Googled it and she found that a little beekeeping library in Thurles County, Tipperary, had a copy of it. So I was able to send her a copy and tell her, you know, to give it to um, wherever she wanted, the university library, the Q and uh, the British, um, the British li library, British honey plants, that was it. So um, I've also provided material for the BBC um, on uh, one or two uh, occasions. So to date, the Irish Bee Journal, 1914, I'm miss missing two issues. 1919, I'm missing almost the whole year. 1923, I'm missing one issue. And 1925, I'm missing one issue. Now, that said, uh, for 25, I think I'm missing an issue out of the Beekeeper's Gazette, but I have it in the Irish Bee Journal, but I don't want to bind it that way. Uh, I'm missing the two issues from 1914, okay, and I'm missing 1919, almost in total. I do have photocopies of the, um, of the missing issues. Now, wait till I see, I think the last slide is, oh yeah, uh, now, if you know or have anything, now, my email address has changed uh, since that. I am still collecting any material I can get. Both of my email addresses, uh, Tipperary Drone, uh, it is still an email address. I don't really... I have your it. other one anyway. I can yeah. use that. Look, look, I can't change that because it's simply 
uh, it's a it has translated as a PDF file. Yeah, no, and that's fine. I, I can put your one yeah, in. I was afraid to do anything that I might lose it and not have it for today. Uh, I don't mind. I'll do a I, I'll do a copy of it some way, and uh, I'll get it converted back. But and even my address has changed now. That's not my address anymore. Uh, my current address is if you have a pen there, or I can email it to you. Yeah, we can. I, yeah, I'll email or text it to you. Uh, it's here. I'm here in Blackrock in Dublin. Uh, and no. This, you're too young in beekeeping to remember uh, Dan DC, but this is Dan. And for a couple of years, we were publishing the oldest and the youngest at the summer course. And uh, wow. Dan, at that stage, was 95. Wow. And uh, that young lassie was three. And that's her mother uh, there uh, from, they were from Cavan. Uh, so we had that, and I used that at the um, uh, in in the talk. Uh, it was the Dan DC Memorial uh, lecture, and and you've just heard um, a rehash of it, if you like. Uh, I, ha I yeah, I haven't had anything else there. I thought I actually had a, a list of the sources uh, that I may have that on the um, the history lectures. I can have a look. But That's anyway, been really amazing. It's very, That's very interesting. That's the story. That's the story about the archives. Oh yes, there was a few other things, of course. Um, when I collect, when I became librarian, which I did shortly after um, I took up beekeeping, I've had it for nearly four, nearly forty years, and uh, it comprised then of about uh, maybe a hundred books. It now comprises about 12, 1,200 uh, because I built it up by getting uh, the books that come in for review and seeing that they were passed on to me. That doesn't happen anymore, but that's uh, neither here nor there. But um, I was going to say, I was saying something there. Uh, what was I? I've lost the train of my thought. I'm getting good at doing that. The older I get, the better uh, I get at Sorry. it. Um, I just can't remember what I was going to say there. Just about the, the amount of stuff you have or the... Oh, yes. How you yes, came together, I do. the credit, I do. credit and where you got one it. Of, so. One of the things that I got from in the library or with the library was a bound set of on Baccarat. And I remembered the time that they did it about 19... In the 1980s, I think I can't remember, but 1986 or seven, and every association in the country sponsored uh, a volume or two of it, and I went reading it. And um, there's different ways you can bind books. I don't know anything about book binding, yeah. but you can do perfect binding, which is anything but perfect. What they do is they cut off the hinge. And then they come in inside it so that you have a series of loose pages and they stitch it there. The problem is you can't open it. Oh, nice. Or there's perfect, uh, there's, um, you, you can stitch it by opening the fold and stitching through it so that when you open the book, it lies flat in your hand like my phone there and you don't have any difficulty. They don't like doing that because it's more time consuming. But anyway, I discovered they also clipped, they, they cut the text on one of them. They cut it crooked and clipped off um, the bottom half, the bottom line of every page. On another one, they bound it back to front. So I decided I was going to get the binding done properly. Uh, I, I haven't got around to that yet. I actually did a, a book binding course uh, in order to be able to do it myself at cost, but I never got around uh, to uh, doing it. But anyway, that's um, that's. So I'm I'm still I'm still actively collecting. It's still a job in hand. Oh, it and, is. Um, do you use the internet much now, then, or do you find uh, like? I, I do. Because, I mean, it can be information overload sometimes when you Google something. So do you find somebody, it like a helper? Somebody, somebody is offering copies of the Irish Bee Journal for sale for about $120 a time. Ooh. I don't know where they're coming from. Mm. I suspect that at best 
there are some kind of um, reprints, some kind of um, photographic reprints. They're not original. Which you can do now quite easily, yeah. You can, yeah. yeah. I don't want to go, I'm not going to go down that road at that price. Um, I've probably put the, the whole thing together at absolutely minimal cost. Um, and, you know, I, I continue on doing it. The more of a thing you have, the harder it is to get the few that you don't want, that you haven't got. You know, you're going to get duplicates. Yeah. I've often uh, gone to people and, um, you know, put put out notices in the B press that if anybody has them, that I would um, trade on a 10 to 1 basis if needs be. If I was getting one, I'd be quite prepared to give a full year that somebody didn't have. But I, I didn't, nobody collects them. Just nobody is collecting them. Yeah. Uh, when when Jerry Burbridge had them, when Northern Bee Books had them for sale in uh, Stoneley, uh, I was the only customer that they had for them. It was yeah. not interested. And um, so say if, so anyone who'd be interested in accessing any of the information that you have, they'd contact you directly, basically, and you, you have the library. Borrow, they cannot borrow any of this stuff. Yeah. This stuff is way too they fragile. Just see it. Yeah. Um, but I've always made it available. And I, I, well, people contacted me over the years for different uh, reasons. For instance, uh, the Irish beekeepers used to run um, a series called uh, our readers at home. Yeah. And they print a photograph of the beekeeper in his apiary. And uh, there's beekeepers from all over the country. Uh, not maybe a huge number of them because it was something that was discontinued probably in the mid 90s. He used to bring it back now and again. Uh, I remember one man contacted Michael Gleason. He had a cup uh, that his grandfather won and uh, Michael sent me uh, the details and um, we wrote to him and told him that the cup would be coming back to uh, to Gormanston for the honey show and he could have a look at it if he wanted and he actually brought down his own grandson to be photographed with the cup. Uh, he had a photograph of his grandfather with it taken in 1950 and I was also able to give him uh, an article that his grandfather has published and three photographs of his apiaries in different parts of the, uh, of the North. He broke every rule that he could. He was a member of the RIC and they weren't supposed ever to tell where they were living. And here he was publishing photographs of his apiary behind the barracks in wherever it was in Banbridge or somewhere else. So, um, but nothing, nothing obviously happened. Uh, but the grandson was absolutely delighted to be able to come down, get the photograph with his, his own grandson taken and um, have uh, details, uh, a bit more information about his, uh, his uh, grandfather going home. I tried to talk him into becoming a beekeeper. He did a beginner's course, but it never went any further than that. So. And um, would you consider, because there seems to be a book in this somewhere. I know it's a lot to, you know, there's a lot of information to make more concise. But... Well, when, when I was doing, when I was collecting the stuff, I kept a very good file on everything I was doing. Yeah. I kept copies of everything. I had to back then. Um, when I went on to doing things on the internet, uh, things get lost on the internet. You don't have them anymore. Emails, you just can't print out everything. So, uh, but, but yeah, I'm, well, I'm sure I don't know whether there is or not. Um, maybe, maybe I could. It would certainly make for an interesting read anyway, and you've lots of nice material there. Yeah, so it just yeah. sprung to mind there, you know, towards the end as you were talking. Um, yeah. Um, well, look, at it. I have the whole thing at my fingertips. I know yeah. it. But there was one other thing, of course, I forgot to tell you when I was uh, telling that everything landed up uh, to my own uh, doorstep. Uh, when I was reading through on Baccarat, there was a man called Thomas J. Crow used to write for, was writing for on Baccarat. 
And I noticed too that he also wrote for the Irish Bee Journal. And in 1910, they published his wedding photograph with an explanation of why he hadn't been available and why he hadn't been writing in recent years. And he was from a place called Manave in Galway. And I happened to know somebody over there, so I contacted them. And they came back to me with his daughter's name. She was a Mrs. Hode in Chum, County Galway. So uh, name and address, I wrote to her. And I got back a letter in very shaky handwriting. I haven't time to do anything for you know. I'm going into hospital, but I'll do it when I come out. And I thought by the look of the hand that she wouldn't come out. So I let it go about three. Well, she did say to me that her brother would have all this stuff. She never said where the brother lived. So when she came back out of hospital, I, or I, I wrote to her and said I hope she was well and she wrote back yes she was and she was in great form and the handwriting was still as shaky as ever but uh, so I had asked her where did her brother live he lived in Gormanston County Meath so I was able to call over to him and I did get material from him again so every time I went looking for something it almost landed onto my own hall door or the beekeeping hall door so to speak so anyway that's the that's the story of it more or less i probably left out some bits and pieces of it oh but, no that's amazing you've given me so, so much to go on i'm gonna to have to go back yeah. and and listen to this through now again a couple of times and write yeah. something up so um thanks a million i really appreciate it well,